Lord, thank you that you have given us the opportunity to live in a country that uh, votes on their um, uh, leaders. And that means that we have a responsibility to know uh, in elections so that we might honor you in how we cast our votes. And so, Lord, we place that before your throne of grace uh, that you might have mercy on us. We're not looking to elected officials ultimately, Lord. We're looking to you. Um, but uh, you would be pleased to place men uh, and women there who would stand for biblical principles and godly principles, Lord. And we entrust that into your hands. And I, this morning, Lord, and the men who have awakened this day to know your word, come and speak to us today, Lord Jesus, through your Psalm 25. We would, we would ask it. We would plead with thee. And just like the psalmist, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're in Psalm 25, and um, it was, again, a privilege for me to be able to study and hopefully bring this psalm to you. It's a little longer psalm than we usually have, so I'm going to try to work through it quickly, uh, though hopefully um, successfully. Uh, by way of introduction, the Psalm 25 is what is called an acrostic psalm. Um, in other words, each word in each of the verses follows the Hebrew alphabet. Um, however, it is not a pure acrostic psalm because there are some anomalies or deviations in several, uh, 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 several of the verses. But you can see that the psalmist is doing that to some degree. Uh, it is considered to be a, what is called a lament psalm. And just like we, the word lament is the kind of thing that is involved, it's, but it is also filled with complaints and petitions and expression of trust, but it does not have a specific lament section, which is weird to call it a lament psalm. So many would call this a didactic psalm, didactic from the Dasko, a Greek word for meaning to teach, for containing a, a section of confidence, of wisdom, and for instruction. And now, the psalm is uh, uh, difficult to outline um, for several reasons, uh, but there are a, a great deal of repetition throughout the psalm. For example, being ashamed or being put to shame. Notice verse 2, 3, 5, 20, and 21. Another theme of affliction in verses 9, 16, and 18. And in this instruction of, uh, about certain things in 4, 5, 8, 9, 12, and 14. So the idea in the Psalms are very general, making it a difficult um, to assign it to a particular occasion to David's life. Overall, the theme, uh, as according to Dr. Ross, and I agree that God is a teacher of the afflicted and a guide for the erring. Or you could say it is a plea to be delivered from hateful enemies, to be forgiven for sin, and to be given instruction for the right way to live. So, <clears throat> I have uh, followed Dr. Ross's outline to some, de most of the degree, and notice it really has only one theme, though it's divided in two in my notes. It's just the confidence in prayer to God. Um, notice the theme of deliverance, guidance, and forgiveness will be the themes that's involved. As you start in verse 8 through 11, pray for forgiveness. Verses 12 through 14, a, a, a kind of in the middle of the psalm, that, uh, what is it to fear the Lord? And then um, 15 through 21, the need and the condition 
uh, that we should pray, and then uh, the very end, one statement about redemption of Israel. And therefore, that is the song. Let's look at the first section in verses 1 through 7. And the, the first aspect of that, if you notice I'm trying to um, accentuate certain things, is deliverance. So the first three verses deals with deliverance. <clears throat> when it says, um, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without a cause will be ashamed. <coughs> so notice the emphasis, the first, to you. Um, I lift up my soul. Ever, that's the beginning of where uh, God is getting our attention. Or sh <laughs> when we finally says, all right, God, you got my attention. My, my, I'm looking to you. I think we should quickly ask God to cause us to get us our attention. And not the last thing. And notice, in you. I have trusted. These are all emphasized in the Hebrew text. And he gives his request. Let me not be ashamed. Let me not be ruined and destroyed and defeated. And so he's asking in the situation that he's in. Uh, request number two. Let not my enemies be victorious over me. Uh, those who wait in hope, that's the concept when he says uh, the, the word in verse 3, those who wait, those who wait in hope. You can wait in a nervous way. You can wait in an unbelieving way. It's not what he's talking about. But as you, if you're a person who waits in hope with God, now what is hope? It's the confident assurance that God will do what he will, says he will do in his timing. And if that's what we're doing when we look to Him, not that you ask, yes, Lord, help now. I need it now. Knowing that He will do it in His time. And if we wait in that way, we'll have more confidence in God. Just waiting on you, Lord. Here, here I am, help. You know, but I am waiting on you. And we're going to find out the concept of wait. How many times have people told you that? How many times have you said, well, you know, you just need to wait on the Lord. You know, you just need to wait on the Lord. Well, what does that mean? You know, some people who think wait on the Lord, you're supposed to sit down and twiddle your thumbs and wait. You're going to find that in this psalm, the concept of waiting is very active. Very active. And so, if you're going to say that I'm waiting on the Lord biblically, this psalm is going to help you to know what that means in verses 4, 5, and the following uh, on that. So he switches from deliverance to guidance. And notice in verse 4, <clears throat> Make me know your ways. Make me know your ways. Not just know my ways. But make me know my ways, actively seeking. Are you seeking the Word of God? Seeking God through the Word? That's the only way that you truly will be waiting properly, biblically, on this. Make me know your ways and teach me your paths. How can you know His paths if you don't know His Word on these things? Lead me in the truth. Well, make him know my ways and leaking in his truth and teach me. Notice how many, you know, teach, uh, lead, for you are the God of my salvation. And notice this. Uh, New American Standard has the word for. I don't know where they got that. From the Hebrew text, it's either in or on. Now, on you, I wait all day. Now, do you get it? I wait all day. How is he waiting? 
Well, verses 4 and 5 tell you how he's waiting. What? Know the way. Teach me the path. Teach me the truth. I'm seeking the truth. I am seeking what you, your ways. That's how you are waiting. Waiting is not sitting down and sit, twiddling your thumbs, just waiting. Come on, hurry up. It is actively seeking the truth and the paths of God. When I figured that out, I went, my, that's sure going to help me in counseling people and talking to people when they're in trouble. Well, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. And you're just sitting there like, you, you know, no, you're not waiting correctly. So uh, waiting is not passive. It's active. And I think that will give us uh, a great hope in these things. Now, notice he says, teach me your past. Now, I've, I've, I know I've done this in my class here, but I know also that good teaching is part of rep you repeat things. And so seeking the path and seeking the truth are just ways that God is saying. And I want to show you again one of my favorite take, texts on on walking down, when he says to seek the truth or seek him, you're walking down a certain path, okay? And it is the ancient path. Why? Because many people have walked down this path. Many people have gotten off the ancient path thinking they can find a, a, a shortcut in life and have found that it, they get in all kinds of trouble. Um, but let's look at the ancient path. Uh, I want to look at Psalm first, and then we're going to turn to Jeremiah. Psalm 119. Lord willing, we might get there one day. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll stop the Psalms whenever you want to, you know, because there's a bunch of them. But Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Ever been in the dark, stumbling around trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to get out or what's the best way to get out of this place? And you're stumbling over things and rocks or whatever. If I only had a light to my path. And that's what the word is, spiritually. How many people put their Bible aside and therefore they're in the dark. They don't turn on the flashlight, which is your, the Word. The Word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, the correct path. So remember Psalm 119, verse 105. Now, keep turning over as you pass through Isaiah and get into Jeremiah and the prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 6, these have become impo important things, okay? So, the Word of God is my lamp. It is the light into my path. It allows me to see how to go. Notice Jeremiah, the prophet who was just before the nation of Israel was taken into captivity in Babylon because of their disobedience. And Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see, and ask for the ancient path. Stand by, ask. What is the ancient path on this? What does the ancient word say I am to go? Where the good way is. And walk in it. Once somebody shows you the path or you know the path by looking in the word, that's the ancient path. Where the good word, how you know you're on the ancient path? Well, if it's an ancient path, it's, it's got a lot of divots in it, right? Even on the, the rocks, you can tell the path. Then you, it's easy to stay on the ancient path once you're on it. 
in the sense of knowing where it's, where, what direction to go, whether I'm supposed to turn left or I'm supposed to turn right or I'm going to go straight. <coughs> where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find, notice this, rest for your souls. And notice what they said. But we will not walk in it. How devastating. What a, what a letdown in that verse, right? But what does your heart say? Does your heart say, I will not walk in it? Or does your heart say, yeah, that's where I want to go. And whichever way we need to ask God to strengthen our heart or to change our heart in it. This is waiting on the Lord. It is teaching me the path, leading me in the path, leading me in the truth so I can wait on Him in the Lord. That's all we learned today. That'd be great, wouldn't it? But He has more on that. In verses 6 through 7, one of the ways that we um, get off the path and are not on the ancient path, it's because of our sin. It's a roadblock. And it's uh, interesting to me that in verses 6 and 7 in Psalm 25, that the, the prayer of remembrance is the prayer of asking for forgiveness. Now, I don't know about you all, but I, the Lord was pleased to allow me to grow up in church, and I can remember the Lord's table in this particular church, and it had the word remembrance um, etched in to uh, the, the Lord's table and had all the elements on it. Remembrance. I can't remember the whole phrase, but I can remember it. And I'm saying, you know, that's what this is saying right here. It's talking about a remembrance, and the remembrance is to ask for forgiveness. And so notice verse 6 and 7. Let me read it. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness. These are typical Hebrew words, rachamim and, and the chesed that he speaks about here, the compassion or mercies, you could say the same thing as, uh, as or compassion, and loving kindness, the loyal uh, uh, covenantal love that God has given to the nation of Israel. It's the mercy and grace and love of God is what he's stressing here in compassion and in your loving kindness for they have been from of old or that Hebrew word means eternity. So I'd just rather translate it that way. It is of old. It can mean of old if it's referring to uh, 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 human beings, but when it refers to God, it often and most often is referred to eternity. So remember, O oh Lord, your compassions and your loving kindness, for they have been from eternity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgression. Oh, hallelujah, right? Somebody can say that, right? According to your loving kindness, remember you me. For your loving, for your goodness sake, O oh Lord, for your goodness sake. So, notice here, the Lord, rem remember these mercies and loving kindness. Uh, the purpose is that from eternity you have mercies and loving kindness toward us. And then do not remember, remember your mercy. Remember your loving kindness, but don't remember my sin. And he, that means he, he's using the concept, well, when is it that God doesn't remember our sin? In the sense that he forgives it. Uh, in one sense, God doesn't forget anything, but he forgets it in the sense that he never brings it up for condemnation because it's under the blood of Jesus, right? Lord, remember according to your loving kindness and according to your good sake. So, if you're looking for uh, deliverance, uh, um, 
in guidance and forgiveness, we must turn to the Lord in these things. Guidance, he's talked about. Now forgiveness in um, verses uh, 6 and 7. Notice that in 8 through 11, he now says, uh, because the Lord is, teaches and leads us, he prays again for forgiveness. Do you think forgiveness is important? If you want guidance and direction from God, you have to be clean before Him. He says, you, you come into Him and say, Lord, I got this, I got this big problem. I, I, I need some help here. And He says, yeah, we got one thing we need to deal with first <laughs> before we deal with this. Because notice verse 12, I hadn't got there yet. You, you know, who is the man who fears the Lord? Well, that, that phrase fears the Lord, it's not I'm scared of God. It's, it's a phrase in the wisdom literature to mean that you're a godly man. If you, I can hear my granddaddy uh, right now. He said, well, he's a God-fearing man. That, that was good. He was, in other words, he was a godly man. He used those terms, or an upright man, he would use those terms. We don't use those terms anymore, but the Bible does. Uh, in the wisdom literature, a godly man was a man who feared God. Not that he's afraid to come to him. Um, if we still use the phrase around here. I haven't seen it on cars anymore, uh, I'm thankful. But it says, you know, fear this or no fear. Well, if no one has no fear of God, then, you know, I don't want to be around him because he'd just kill you. Just, I mean, if, if they really had that attitude... Well, if they don't fear God, what are they going to do to you? So uh, the concept of fear sometimes, it, it, well, when, we, when we teach it, we have to use a lot of the explanation of what that means. A, a, a mother scream, uh, hollering at people at the swimming pool, what's that child? He has no fear of the water. Is that good? No, it's not good. When you get on top of this roof and you get close to the edge, there, there should be something that comes up. Well, I'm getting close to the edge here. You get a little fear. Is that good? Well, yeah, it's good. So there's good fear and there's bad fear, right? But we often don't talk, sit down and think about it. But fearing God, I mean, I feared my father. Though I loved him, he never got out of line with me. He always uh, punished me correctly, as far as I remember. And... Um, uh, but uh, somebody said, let's go do something. So, oh, no, my dad would tan my hide for that. You know, I feared my father in that sense. It kept me out of a lot of trouble. Now, that's a very basic aspect of fear of God, right? But it is something that we should have. So here in verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. I, I, I don't know whether he means that he instructs sinners to get into the way that they should go or that because we are sinners in the way that he also instructs us. It's true both ways, right? But isn't it wonderful that you don't have to think that, um, <laughs> that you got everything together for us to instruct him. If only the only thing that God asks you to do is be clean before him. If you have sinned, let's repent and turn and say, God, I have, uh, uh, I have sinned, and because I have trusted you as my Savior, uh, my sins can be forgiven. And forgiven. There are consequences for sin, but also there is forgiveness of sin. And God can bring beauty out of ashes, can He? In those consequences on that. Yes, sir. Well, there is a tendency as a general rule that in our younger life we got things we wish we didn't do. Because of our youth, not knowing maybe uh, the uh, impulses of sin uh, uh, were uh, not 
We hadn't learned how to put to death the deeds of the flesh, those kinds of sins. So the youthful sins are usually, uh, I mean, if a person hasn't learned uh, beyond his youthful sin in his middle age or his old age, he'll still be doing youthful sins. But I think it's because everything's new. Uh, I often uh, encourage parents, um, you know, as you travel through life, you learn things by God's grace. We, we teach sometimes our children what right and wrong is and from the Bible, but do we teach them the emotions uh, that uh, they're going to feel when sin entices them? I don't think we teach that well or even at all. Uh, because here's what happens. Uh, a youth has been trained in the scriptures. He knows certain things are wrong. He, he, he in, then begins to embrace a certain sin, and he begins, his mind begins to get uh, uh, waffly because, well, I was taught that this is wrong. Why am I so enticed to go do it? Why is there some kind of seemingly within me a desire to, and, and, and some kind of so-called pleasure in, in moving toward that object for which God said and I've been taught is not correct? And there is an enticement, isn't there? Why would people sin if there's no enticement and some, some enjoyment? It, it doesn't last long, does it? It's temporary. But if we, if we don't tell our children and our young people about that, then they're going to be fools because they're going to say, well, you know, they have told me all about it. Everybody tells me this is wrong, but why is this? Well, it has a hook in it, doesn't it? It, it, it feels, it feels fun, fun for a while, but there are consequences for those. There's a hook in it. And so we might be able to say, hey, you know, it's, it's like going fishing. And the debate has a hook in it. And yeah, it looks good, smells so good. And they, and they, how come they tell me it's so wrong? Because it's got a hook in it. I mean, there is some pleasure, I've been told, of, 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 of cocaine and all that, just that and the other, but it's what? There's a hook in it. There, you can start talking about all kinds of certain. Why do people do that? Well, there is an attraction to it. Not just that it is wrong. We need to teach what are the emotions of that so that when they're in it, it says, don't be fooled on these things. And so I think that's part of the youth that he's speaking about. At least that's how I would take it. Foolishness. And it's, e I mean, I mean, old people can do it, but it's you. But the, but when old people do it, it is still youthful stuff that they should have young in their done in their youth, right? Should have learned that lesson by now. <laughs> On there. All right. So, verse. Uh, we're back in twenty-five. Eight. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. Isn't that great? Uh, he leads the humble in justice, not the prideful. He teaches the humble his ways. Notice the way up is down. Pride will not get you where you need to go on this. And in verse 10, the paths of, of the Lord are loving kindness. There's that loving kindness, chesed again, and truth. So if you're in the way, you have his loving kindness, his mercy. You have his truth. You have his care to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. In other words, making sure you're in the way. For in your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity for it is great. I think everybody can say that. It doesn't take a, a person uh, that has kicked over the traces, as they call it, and has just chucked God and say, well, you know, that he could say that. I think everybody can say that. 
to whatever degree. Pardon my iniquity, Lord, for it is great. I remember uh, contemplating that <laughs> this weekend and, and praying again, saying, Lord, my sin is great. That you have forgiven it is something. So you notice how uh, if you want to have guidance from the Lord, there is a way of, of forgiveness that has to come. Don't expect God to guide you and direct you if you haven't repented from your sins of what they are. And so in verse 12, he begins to talk about the fear of the Lord. We've already talked about that a little bit. He will, the person who fears God, he, God, will instruct him in the way he should choose. Oh, that's good. His soul will abide in prosperity, in goodness, in other words. Uh, don't think about the health and wealth kind of thing, but the goodness of God, both physically and spiritually. And his descendants will inherit the land. That was big for the Jewish people because God had promised them a particular land. But he says, hey, if you disobey me, guess what I'm going to do? You still own it? I'm going to kick you out of the land. So that's what the Babylonian captivity is all about in 586 B.C. Um, verse 15, My eyes are constantly toward the Lord, and He will pluck my feet out of the net. Uh, what net? That's what I want to say. Well, any net that would entangle me in sin. Are you, have you been there before and saying, you know, I can handle this, Lord, and all of a sudden I get entangled into my sin, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm hung up, and you say, I can't get out. So what should we do? Lord, could you get me out of the net? <laughs> I'm all tangled up. Yes, sir, I did, I did miss that. Yes, sir, I did <coughs> not do what you said in that, but I'm all tangled up. Help, get me out of the net, the trap. See, that's what sin is. It's a trap. It entices. I mean, what do you have to do? Well, you're, you, you, they put, what, trappers put certain kind of food or whatever for the animals so they can, what, lure them into the trap. You think the evil one does that kind of thing? Well, of course he does. And he knows the flesh that, that is enticed. And so, Lord... If that has happened, and pluck my feet out of the trap. And then um, in verse uh, 16, there's a prayer. Uh, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Ever been lonely? Think you're the only one? Feel afflicted? How easy to get into to a, a, a depression, to, 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 to just fall off the end. What should you do? Turn. Turn to me, Lord. Be gracious to me. Call upon the living God. Before he was talking about the humble. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, there are, it, it all depends on what loneliness and why I'm there and I'm lonely. It could be because of my sin. It could be by my choices. But sometimes uh, loneliness uh, is just uh, um, uh, circumstantial. How do I then handle it? What the evil one likes to do is to separate and to um, uh, cause you to be alone so he can defeat you better. So, therefore, if we're not in fellowship with a group of believers, then it's easier to be defeated because he's going to separate you and then, you know, you don't have your brothers with you and to hold you up and to encourage you. Everybody, that's part, you know, when you go to good Christian counseling, sometimes you need some other, they, they want you to be in fellowship with the believers, 
Why? Because that's part of what God says that helps us to walk along. There are certain burdens, according to Galatians, that we are to uh, uh, carry ourselves, and there are certain burdens that is unbiblical to carry alone. And you go, well, you know, I'm a man, I can take this. Well, I'm sorry, guys. There are certain burdens that we are to carry with our other brothers. So, it depends on what you're alone for. <laughs> yes? I mean, the, the, the loneliness, I mean, I've, I've heard where one of us could be in this whole, whole group right here, even though they were, we were all Christians, but feel like they're completely alone. Yes, sir. We can be in a large, crowded room with, yes. with everybody around. Yes. You could be the life of the party. Yeah, and I think I think that's the beauty of, of the New Testament and, and, and having Christ and the promise that He is with us at all times <coughs> really helps us at that moment. Uh, and the point of being lonely, but knowing that He is there takes that loneliness away. Um, yes, ultimately, it, it, it is knowing the truth of God is with me. And, but at times, God will use another brother right. to come alongside and to tell you, uh, John, something you already know, but yeah. just need to be reminded. Yeah. And so, I mean, don't ever think of that because, oh, he's so spiritual, uh, you don't even remind him. No. If I'm dying in the hospital, come in and tell me what I already know. Okay? Because I need to hear it. I need to be reminded. I need to be encouraged. Whatever the situation is. You can't be isolated as a Christian and live well. You just can't. Yeah, you can't blab everything to everybody. You've got to have a good a godly men and, and, uh, so that we might encourage one another in the most holy faith. To push us on to do things that are honoring to the Lord. Well, 17 through 19, again, uh, let me read them. The trouble of my heart are enlarged. So when he means enlarged, he means it has increased. Okay. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my afflictions and my trouble and forgive all my sin sins. So notice that maybe... Some of his trouble is because of sins. Uh, Look on my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with uh, violent hatred. So he's asking uh, to be delivered and protected in this situation. Uh, and then in his neediness in 15 through 21, um, We've already, uh, in verses 20 and 21, guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed. Notice how that is several times in the early part of the psalm. For I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. Now, notice this. For I wait for you. Now, shall we? I don't have to go back, do I, to the first part of this psalm, why I stressed the waiting. Waiting is not inactive. It is very active in pursuing the path, the truth that God wants us to have. When we wait on a God, we're just not folding arms and waiting for God's answer. We are, if you're doing it biblically, biblically waiting is pursuing the truth of God in the situation. And so uh, he ends up by saying, um, uh, redeem Israel. You have to realize that um, that was David's responsibility to be, bring the nation before him, and he knew from the Davidic covenant that God would redeem. What is the word redeem? We've been redeemed. What? We have been having our sins paid for. Well, Lord, redeem Israel. 
may their sins be paid for. In the first coming, Christ came to redeem us from our sins and to give us eternal life. He's coming the second time to set up His kingdom uh, uh, to those who have, and redeem all things. That's the word that is used. When, uh, when Adam fell in the garden, what happened to creation? It fell too. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about that we have been redeemed spiritually from our sins if we placed our trust in Jesus Christ. But ultimately, he's coming back the second time, and he's not only going to give us all that that redemption is, he's going to redeem the whole creation. He's going to bring it brand new because he's going to lift the curse of the fall, and he's going to accentuate in the, the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 and 22 where there is no sin. And that's our home. And that's our uh, destiny if we've placed our trust in Christ. So what does this psalm say? Did you notice there is this constant repetition of, of forgiveness and deliverance uh, uh, throughout the entire psalm and the, the psalmist praying for it. So if you need deliverance, okay, if you need guidance, this psalm might be good. So what, what does this psalm say in one sentence? I try to discipline myself to say this. It would be this. Confident prayer to the Lord for deliverance, guidance, and forgiveness must come from our confidence in the Lord who causes us to fear Him, the proper way of understanding that, and to wait on Him, the proper understanding of waiting on Him. Or maybe a practical application. When God-fearing people are threatened with trouble, they are to pray for forgiveness, guidance, deliverance, and wait on the way of the Lord to deliver them. In trouble, need deliverance of some type, Psalm 25. Put it down on your list. Uh, how about any questions, thoughts, comments? Yes, Lawrence. Yes, sir. If he's God that's coming to bring him, and he won't give him relief until after God moves it, why should it be for deliverance? Well, it's the same reason, if you think through it a little bit, Lawrence, the history of the nation of Israel. Think about all the, the ungodly things that have gone against it. Why? Because God has only chosen one nation. And when he does, guess what? If the evil one can thwart that nation's destiny, they have thwarted God. And so now we are his children. <laughs> and, we, and when we do, we got a target on our backs because he can't take us to hell, but he sure like to make us go through a lot of it here on earth. And if we will trust God, we can thwart the enemy in that way. Doesn't mean we're not going to have battles. Yep, we are. But we can win. Ralph? One of the things I love to uh, wonder is he, he's in the middle of a pandemic. If we watch the news today, we're hearing about yeah. people getting blown by all the time and all the time. Yeah. And if, if you're around that kind of thing, if you don't have what the truth is, you, yeah, it can get you really under the pile, can't you? Really under the pile, both personally and uh, your whole perspective. Uh, one thing I want to tell you, man, something. We win. <laughs> Not because of we, because of Jesus. I, I know how it is. <laughs> that even if I die, guess what? 
I go in the very presence of God. Matter of fact, that's where you and I are headed. Every one of us are headed for eternity. Have you thought about that today? Have you thought about, okay, I want to live for eternity. I'm going to be there. Might as well live down here. In the light of eternity, you will live different if you live in the light of eternity. And that means taking what, like Psalm 25, and say, okay, that, how many people have that perspective? How many people have a perspective of confident prayer in the Lord for deliverance, guidance, forgiveness, and which must come from the confidence in the Lord who gives us and fears when we wait on Him? Most people say, I, you know, even some Christians, even this day, we will be tempted even this day to forget. That's why we need people to remind us <coughs> as well as the Word. I've, uh, in the last week or two, I've had a pertinent question that has come upon me uh, through an old devotion that I read in Oswald Chambers. Oh, and he's and good. He just, just, throw, just throws stuff at you. Oh. I mean, I mean, it's just played my mind. I mean, I constantly go to it inwardly. Yeah. Like, do I have God or does God have me? Yeah. It's yeah. Both. Yeah. It's just mind-boggling meditation. Yes. <laughs> it, it's both, but which one are you emphasizing? <laughs> <laughs> he, he has his grip on us. Okay. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the word of God. Oh, come, Lord, allow Psalm 25 to rest in our souls this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.